Um, I don't know if you guys have uh, any of the same challenges that I do, I'm guessing, because some of you keep coming back week after week, and I'm telling you my challenges, that you can kind of relate with some of them. Uh, but one of the things that I struggle with is that I have to tell myself intentionally sometimes where I am going. Because autopilot oftentimes will take me off course. And so I get to thinking, like I'm just lost in my head, or I'm listening to a song, or I'm talking to somebody on the phone, and before too long, I'm going someplace that I didn't intend on going. I can think of this uh, happening even back in college, uh, whenever we would drive down First Street in Norfolk, if you turned right, you would go to the community college, and left, you would go to Nebraska Christian College, and I had classes at both, and I had to be really careful because if I wasn't thinking through the process, I would almost always take the wrong turn because it would just come into autopilot. Maybe, maybe you have had that same experience. Your workplace, like you go there all the time. You go there all the time. And then the kids hop in and you're taking them to practice and then all of a sudden you're at work and you're like, how'd I get here? <laughs> like just made that turn and it happened. And those kind of things just happen in life that that we program our minds to think certain ways. And God has wired our brains in a very amazing way that the more times we do things, the more uh, we can do it easily and without thinking about it. It's kind of the thing, like if you've ever driven down the road, uh, and I'm thinking like on the interstate, you're on a long trip, and then you, you suddenly realize that you're about 20 miles further down the road than you thought you were, and you don't even remember going through certain towns. Have you ever had that experience? That's your brain like overriding your, your thought process. And so it knows what's going on. You've repeated this motion and so you just make that path happen. And it's a scary thing like to think, oh wow, like I don't even remember you know, that last five miles or whatever it was. But those kind of things are designed to help it make, us, make it easier for us to think, but also easier to respond. Now, athletes do this all the time. Uh, I'm a football fan, and they are just starting. Like, they came off of the draft. They're doing rookie mini camps, and they're trying to establish a certain way of thinking and a certain way of behaving for the players so that when they get on the field in a game-time scenario, it's automatic. They just know it. They don't have to think about it. They don't have to analyze it. They just know, when this play comes up, this is what I do. When the defense is lined up this way, this is what I do. And they just know it and they can play faster. They can respond easier to what's going on. Now, growing up uh, in a rural environment, this type of behavior, we would oftentimes, uh, we, would, we would call these ruts. Like if you've ever gotten on the, the side road, you know, that low minimum maintenance road, uh, or even sometimes the gravel roads after a heavy rain. And somebody has gone through with their four-wheel drive truck and they have cut ruts into the road. Now, if it's a heavily traveled road, you know that cars going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and it even happens uh, on our highways. You can look down the highways and see paths where cars have continually traveled, and that's creating a pathway. And that design by God is actually supposed to be a very good thing. It helps to automate the process. It helps it easier to recall and easier to follow through And and this is something that we want to to have in our life. However, when sin enters the picture, it sometimes hijacks the process. Not that the process is bad, but sometimes you and I can ingrain negative things the same way that the positive things are meant to go in. And so over and over and over, we have done certain things. We've behaved certain ways. We've responded to certain stimulation a certain way. And so this, this is just carved into our life. You know, whenever, whenever your husband or your wife responds with, I love you, you respond with, I love you, right? It's an automatic response, right? But there's other things, more challenging things, things that maybe we don't want to open up in our life. Maybe we grew up in a household that uh, didn't really respond to us with love and care, at least not in what we would classify as a normal way. And I mean, to each of us, though, when we grew up, it was normal. That's how we behave. That's how we respond. And this is just the way life is. And you create these pathways in your life. 
And then somebody new comes into the, the picture and suddenly it challenges that pathway that's established in your life. You see this sometimes in abuse situations where, where somebody is so used to being loved, loved by abuse that they crave more uh, abuse. They, they don't know how to, how to kick out of that rut that's there. Maybe that rut in your life has led to addiction. And every time that trigger is hit, you kick over to addiction. Right? Maybe that, that, that loneliness that's plaguing you, and every time you get locked away in loneliness, you withdraw. Right? That's your, your neurological pathway that you've created. Or maybe it's led you to, to lash out in harmful behavior because that's the pathway that's been created. You, you automatically throw up a wall and you put up a, a huge defense about what's going on, and you've created this. Well, guess what? It takes a lot of time to put that pathway in. And you lay that foundation, and you just keep driving over those same ruts, and they get really deep. And it's super hard to just change the way that we think. But that's what we're talking about today when we talk about anxiety. Anxious for nothing, I believe that some of the problems, some of the challenges that you and I deal with take place within our mind. A lot of times, we create these pathways without even knowing about it. Things happen in our life, right? Sometimes willingly, sometimes unwillingly. Sometimes by our own effort, sometimes by the effort of other people. And they create these, these ruts, these challenges. And the more that we hear the same message multiple times, the more likely it is to create this neural pathway in our life. And so I want to share with you what I believe are three really big keys for us today in trying to change the way that we think. Now, I don't want you in any way, shape, or form to think this is going to be an easy process. It took us a long time to develop, depending on our age, the particular pathways in our mind and in our life. The way that we behave or respond to certain things, it comes pretty naturally. So trying to change that is hard. It's like learning how to do something the wrong way and you've been doing it the wrong way for so long that whenever somebody shows you the right way, you're like, wow, that makes sense. That would be so much easier, but it's not because you've been training yourself the wrong way over and over again. It's way easier to take a young athlete and show them the right way to do it and establish the right pattern than it is to take a seasoned athlete and to try to change the way that they're doing things. That's true in our life. It's true in our workplaces. Right? We can get locked into doing certain habits. We can, we can get locked into our, our study habits at school, doing it certain ways. And the more we do it, the harder it is to change. So it's going to take time. It's going to take a lot of energy to do this, but it's also going to lay a much more solid foundation to allow the change to stick. So here's number one. Number one is to identify the lie. Identify the, the lie. You see, things happen in our life, some are fair, some are not so fair, right? Intentional or unintentional, they create these, these pathways, but we have to realize that there's another force at work. We talked about this a couple weeks ago in the book of Ephesians, chapter 6. Our fight is not just against flesh and blood, right? But it's against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places, right? Satan comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy, it tells us in John chapter 10. He is at work. He is the father of liars, right? And this is what he does. And he works his job masterfully. And he is continually trying to get us to believe things that simply aren't true. And he hijacks God's process. How does he do that? By repetition. The more that we hear untruth presented as truth, the more likely it is to believe that it is actually true. Right? This gets used all the time. It gets used in, in our political thing. It gets used in our news channels. Like, I'll just repeat the same message over and over and over and over again. And pretty soon, you will believe it's true. And whether it's true or not doesn't really matter because your perception is that it's true. We can do the same thing. Case in point, I, uh, I remember the first time that we flew uh, into Orlando. We got into a rental car. Hop in the rental car. GPS does not work so well in a parking garage, by the way. 
And so when you come out, it takes a little bit of time to get it to calibrate a certain way. Now, before we were really using this, I had in my mind, like, okay, I've looked at the map, I've studied the map. If I come out and I'm going this direction, this road's going to come up and I can go here. I'm going to know ex exactly where I'm at. The problem is I came out on a different side than I was anticipating coming out. And so it took me probably a couple hours to recalibrate which directions I was going. I, I found my place because we had the GPS, but I had to, once we stopped, we arrived at the destination, I had to look at the map and go, oh, okay, north is not where I thought north was, right? This completely messed me up. And normally, I'm pretty decent with directions. Even for a guy who lives in a house that's not facing directly north, it's kind of crazy. People come over and they go, which, which direction is that? Well, it's not the direction you think it is because it's just sitting at an angle. But those kind of things happen because we believe certain things are true. And I want you to think about this for a moment. What is something in your life that you believed wholeheartedly, without a doubt, that this is true? And then at some point in time, somebody presented you with the real truth. And you're like, oh. Can you think of any of those things in your life? My guess is you probably won't have to think too far. And sometimes we're pretty gullible. Sometimes we're pretty stubborn. I can be pretty stubborn. That's my wife. She's here today. We were out at night to shine this year putting together some activities. And I looked at the instructions, got the idea, got applauded for you know being a guy who reads the instructions, and so I'm feeling pretty good. And I still put the thing together the wrong way. But because in my head, I saw it a certain way. And I saw that this one post goes into this one coupler right there. And I was convinced. I was like, why isn't this thing making sense? Why isn't this going together? Right? But I had to have somebody else point out to me, oh, it's because you stuck this post in the wrong hole. Oh. Makes sense. Makes sense. How many times do we do that, though? We allow a lie which is believed to be true, to govern our behavior as though it were. And this is a challenge that we live in. I'll take you to what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount. He says, wide is the road that leads to destruction, and narrow is the road that leads to life. Right? But we look around us and we see everybody's doing something. And we think, oh, that must be the right way to do it. But that in itself would be incorrect because few people are doing the right thing based upon the truth. And so it's so easy to get off target here. And I want you to think thoroughly about this, right? And this is probably one of the hardest things about God's word. It's not hard to believe, I don't think, that there is a God who loves me and sent his son to die for me. We've been programmed to think that in America, even if we've not been to church before. We've heard the message, right? But the life change, the resurrection that exists in our life is completely countercultural. It's one thing to say, hey, if you believe that Jesus died for you, like he can forgive you of your sins, you don't have to go to hell, you get a new, a new chance to, to do life. Cool, sign me up. Oh, this, this life is going to be harder? I don't know about that. It's going to require me to change some stuff? People are going to look at you differently. Um, what are some of the things our world tells us? It's okay to get intoxicated. Right? It's okay to just kind of be you. Like you do you, and as long as you do you, it doesn't matter what anybody else is thinking or doing. Right? Every, everything is relative. You can, you can have any kind of, of relationship that you want in life. Right? Because as long as it makes you happy, that's what matters. Or you can identify as whatever you want, as long as you're not harm, harming anyone else. There's a common theme, a con common pattern that exists in a lot of the thinking. Do whatever you want, as long as you're happy and you don't hurt anyone else. But that is not what the Word of God says. There are some standards, there are some things that challenge the way that we think. But because we are situated in the society that we are, because we have the kind of environments in our workplaces or in our schools that we have, we can easily be led to believe things that aren't true 
as though they are. And when we live that way, they affect our life. What we believe affects how we behave. And I believe that that is so true that whenever the, the Bible says that, that whenever you and I look at somebody's life, we can identify believers by their fruits, right? By the behavior that's existing. Not because the behavior is, is the, all in, the, the have all end all, but the behavior points to a greater truth of belief. So we identify the lie. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5 This is on page 969 in the, ba- the Bibles we provide. I'm going to start reading at verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but of the divine power to destroy strongholds. Guys, the ruts that we create, the neurological pathways in our brain that the lies that we believe, those are strongholds, right? Strongholds are meant to keep the enemy out. But if not working properly, they also lock us in. And we can get locked in to a certain way of behavior, a certain way of thinking. But we have weapons that de- demolish the strongholds. Verse 5, we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God, and take every thought captive to obey Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience when your, disob- when your obedience is complete. When you understand the truth and you obey, right? You, you understand what God wants to do, and then you're ready to follow that. Then you can start to point out the things that are untrue. You can identify the lies. And when we identify them, we have to take them captive. We have to control them. Satan is is wanting to have control in our lives, right? He is waging war against us. He is trying to get us to buy these lies. But you and I, through the power of God and his Holy Spirit, promise to live inside of those who believe. And according to the word of truth, we can identify the lies and call them out for what they are. But we have to call them out. We cannot expect our life to be any different if the beliefs that are the foundation for our behaviors are unchanged, if they're unchecked, right? We have to focus on the root of the problem. We identify what's going on. So I'd ask you this question. It's a pretty pointed question, but it's an important question for you. What is your rut? Or perhaps better articulated, what are your ruts? (laughs) Because I believe that we probably have multiple. What are some of the things that have happened in your life that have caused you to think or to believe or to behave a certain way? What are the lies that you need to identify? This may be a question that that keeps you going for the rest of today's message, right? And you don't get past that, and that's okay. But I want you to to at least put this down and and come back to it later. This is not a message you just check off your to-do list. I went to church today. This is a life-altering opportunity. What lies are you believing? What untruths are foundational? Where have you been led away by by maybe your, your parents, the way that you were raised? Where have you been led away by a spouse, by a group of friends, by the society we live in? Where have you become to, to identify things in your life according to this untruth. And if you don't know the answer to that, I would encourage you to go back to our Dangerous Prayer series. And it says in Psalm 139, right? Search me, God. Know my heart. Know my anxious thoughts. See if there be any offensive way in me and lead me in your paths of righteousness. Lead me in the way ever lasting right this can be our prayer God help me to see the untruths in my life right search me help me to realize the errors that I don't even know exist so that I can be led in the right way to go search me God know my heart know my anxious thoughts see if there's any offensive way in me after you identify the lie you need to replace it with the truth, right? After you see that there is a rut 
and it's going the wrong direction, it constantly pulls you off target, you need to fill the rut, right? But you need to begin to lay down a new pathway. You need to make sure that you're anchoring it with the truth. Oftentimes what happens though is we, we fill in this lie and we begin to believe another, right? And, and we were over here and now we're over there and where we need to be is on this path of righteousness, right? That few will follow, and so we need to make sure that we're anchored in the truth when it comes to that. Oftentimes what will happen, though, is we identify the lie in our life. And a lot of times what we identify is not the root cause, but actually the behavior that's on the surface. And we go, you know, hey, this thing in my life, I, I realize that it makes people uncomfortable. I know it's not good. God tells me it's not good. And so I just need to stop doing it. And so that's what we do. We just make this conscientious decision, I'm not going to do this anymore. Or, there's something in your life that you need to start doing and you haven't been doing like, you know, reading your Bible or praying. And so you have this behavior, this thing that you need to do, and so what happens, you and I, just like New Year's resolution, we just decide in our head that we're going to start doing this certain thing. So what we do is we alter our exterior behavior, but Christianity has never been about behavior modification. It's about heart change, right? It's what lies beneath the surface because what's in there is what really needs to change. And the key to that, we've used this passage a lot over the last year in particular, but last two years probably, Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Do not be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then you will be able to Attest to what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Right? We are no longer conformed to the way that everybody else is doing it. We're no longer conformed to the lies that Satan has sold us, to the things that we have experienced, but instead we lay a new foundation in the truth of God. And when that foundation is laid, it transforms us. Right? Those behaviors are changed because of our beliefs. We're getting down to the core. Because what oftentimes happens when we, when we just check the behavior, we can do it for a while. We can go on that diet for a while. We can change the way that we eat, the change the way that we exercise for a while. We can even, maybe even drop a few sizes for a while. But then what happens? Life. Right? We just kind of kick back into that rut because the core beliefs haven't really been changed. So how do, we, how do we go about that change? Well, look at that again, that 2 Corinthians 10, 5. We take, capture, we, we take captive every thought and we make it obedient to Christ. We make it obedient, not to us, not to what's popular. We make it obedient to Christ. The only way that we're going to do that is to get into the Word of God, which if we're using that Ephesians passage, Ephesians chapter 6, Right? Our fight is not against flesh and blood, but against the spiritual forces of evil. We have the armor of God. The foundational piece is the belt of truth. We have to be in the Word of God. Uh, Romans chapter 8, verses 5 and 6. Romans chapter 8, verses 5 and 6. And this is on page uh, 944 in the Bibles we provide. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things that are of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on things that are of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death. But to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. The opposite of anxiety is peace, right? Whenever it feels like there is so much uncertainty, when the ground is shaking beneath you, what you're really craving is peace. And the answer for the peace is not to crave the things of your flesh, the, the things of your sinful nature, but to actually crave the, the spiritual things, the things of God. Paul says this also in his letter to the Colossians, in Colossians chapter 3, where he says, set your, your minds on things above and not on earthly things talks about dying to your old self, your old way of life, and, and being made new into the image of God, and, and, and taking on these, 
these new embodiments of this new life, this new self. Colossians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 4 goes through these same kind of old life, new life, old behavior, new behavior kind of things. Right? And this whole thing, man, it can seem super daunting. You get into the Word of God and it's challenging you every step of the way. And our, our tendency is to try to address the external. Right? The behavior. But what we really need to focus on is the belief. But you still need to be in the Word of God. A lot of times we don't even know that we're wrong until we've been exposed to the truth. Right? We continue to do the wrong thing time after time and time. And, and, and gone unchecked, we continue to go down that same bad path. And we can say that I don't want to go to that destination, but as long as we keep walking the same path, that's where we keep ending up. And then we do something crazy like saying, man, how did I get here again? Uh, by following the same path, right? How many times have we done that in our life? I mean, think about that. In your life, how many times have you went, gosh, I, I said I wasn't going to do this again. But in hindsight, when I look back at me, Every step I took was the same step. I had an opportunity one time. I was invited to an AA meeting. And, and this lady, she shared, she shared something that I thought was pretty powerful. And she, she had some grandkids. And she knew, like, if I, if I drink again, then I could lose my relationship with my grandkids. My kids have told me. They'll cut me out of their life. But then every step that I took to the liquor store, I knew, I knew that was a consequence, but I just kept taking the steps, just kept taking the steps, pretty soon those steps got easier to take, and she, she lost that, but how many times, like, just being real in our lives, do we do the same thing, we know what we're doing is wrong, we know the direction it's going to lead us, but we keep taking those steps, because that pathway, that rut is cut really deep. And what we really need to do is create a trench, right? So a rut is something that kind of, it just happens. We do the same thing over and over again, and it just happens. But a trench is meant to deliver resources, to deliver supplies. And so we intentionally cut this rut into our life, and, and we call it something different, right? It's, it's a trench that leads to life. And so we have to tell ourselves time and time again, this is right. I know I want to do this, but this is right. I know that this is the direction I'm pulling, but this is right. And so we constantly fight this battle. We do it over and over and over again in our life. Philippians chapter 4. So a lot of this message comes out of the book of Philippians. Uh, and I believe that it hits it pretty well. The Apostle Paul is writing while being in prison, saying this, be joyful always, don't be anxious about anything, which seems crazy, but when you realize he's been beaten, he's been bruised, he's been shipwrecked, he's started new churches, he's had people turn their back on him, and still he's writing, rejoice in the Lord always. But he says in, in verse 4, rejoice in the Lord always, again I will say it, rejoice, let your reasonableness be known to everyone, the Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and, and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Okay, we're going to come back to those in the coming weeks. But verse 8 is really where I want to focus our energy for a little bit. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if anything is, is any, there is any excellence, if anything, there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things, right? Think about the good things. In this list, as well as the list in Ephesians chapter 4 or in uh, Colossians chapter 3, man, they can seem daunting. They can seem overwhelming. It can seem like, gosh, you're never going to live up to this. And, and Something that's meant to reduce your anxiety can actually increase it quite a bit. Because before you felt like, you know, you're a pretty bad person and now you know you are. Right? And it, and it can be this, just looking in a mirror and you're looking, you're supposed to be looking at Jesus and what you're seeing is all the imperfections. 
what you're seeing is all of the insecurities, all of the fears and all of the failures, all of the flaws coming to attention. And what I want to encourage you with is step three in the process. Step one is identify the lie. Step two is replace it with the truth. But step three is this. Repeat it until it's natural. Right? That's what they do in sports. That's what we, what we try to teach our kids when they're going through classes in school. Repeat it until it becomes natural. Until you can understand it. Until you, until you get the process. Until you don't even have to think about the process. Just keep doing it. Keep carving this new trench. Right? Abandon that lie. Fill it in. Get rid of that thing. Call it out. Call it what it is. It's not true. It leads to destruction. But find this road that leads to life. If you are on it, and just keep hitting that path over and over and over and over again in your life. And repetition, repetition is the key to memorization. Repetition is the key to life change and transformation. And that's exactly what Satan uses against us, right? Because he will repeat the lie over and over again. You are worthless. You are no good. You will never figure this out. You will never measure up. You're not going to be the kind of mom that you need to be, the kind of husband that you need to be. You are never going to be the kind of employee. You're never going to be on time. You are always going to fail. You're never good enough. He repeats it until we believe it. And what we need to do is we need to allow the truth of God into our life, and we need to continue to repeat it. We need to override the program. We need to hear the voice of truth that says, you are my son or my daughter whom I love. I will never leave you or forsake you. We need to hear the voice from God who constantly takes what we view as being the least of these and makes it into something great and marvelous. He takes the broken and makes it beautiful. We need to allow this truth to just invade our life. And we need to, to, to reprogram our thought process. Psalm 111, or excuse me, Psalm 119, verse 11. If you grew up in the church, there's some songs that kind of go back to, to some of these verses. Of, but what I want to share with you is this. It says, I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Right? The answer for not having this sinful behavior was to take God's word and internalize it. To take God's word and internalize it. We get to uh, verse 105, and it says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light into my path. I have sworn an oath and confirmed it to keep your righteous rules hidden your word in my heart. I've allowed it to illuminate my pathway, to guide my steps. I've internalized it, right? I've made it real. I've allowed it to do its work within me. We have to be guided in the paths of truth. And so what I want you to, to strive to do, you know, not only is to identify the lie, but, but what is the new pathway that you need to create? And what is the truth of God that you need to lean upon? Maybe you need to, to do a little Google search, right? And just simply remember this. Like there's lots of people you can lean on, right? Contact a pastor. Contact a, a small group friend. Reach out to somebody else in your, your church family. But if you're, you're really needing to know something, I want to let you in on a secret. Because sometimes people will ask me a question. And it's like, gosh, I don't know. I don't have the entire Bible memorized. Uh, and so I'll do this. What does the Bible say about fill in the blank. Guess what? You can usually find it. You know, you're, you're dealing with, with guilt or shame. What does the Bible say about that? And it'll give you a list of verses. Right? I realize you've got to be careful what you click on, but if you're taking the Word of God from the Word of God, I don't know how you're going to go wrong with that. Then dive into the context. Get to see it. Get to understand it a little bit. You see something that rings a bell, Right? Open it up in your Bible and read the thing. Repeat it. Read it in different translations. Read the full context. Start learning what other people are saying about it. Those things are called commentaries. Start hearing what they're saying. Start getting some of the background information. Memorize it, right? The key to, to memorization is to repeat it over and over and over again. You say it until you, you just have it embedded 
within you. You, you pray on it. You, man, just allow God to speak into your life. God, I'm reading this truth in your life, and I'm, I'm wrestling with this truth in your life. Help me to receive it. Help me to understand it. Help me to embody it. Help me to express it. Instead of buying this lie, help me to replace it with this truth. And so one of your challenges this week, not only is to identify the lie in the new path, but find a key verse that's going to help you to reprogram the way that you're thinking and and spot it in your life. There's been a couple key verses in my life. Romans chapter 12, verse 1, what do we do in, in, in light of all of this, in the mercy of God, right? We offer ourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is our spiritual act of worship, right? This is a life verse for me. My life is not my life, it's his life because he redeemed it. And so everything that I say and do needs to be for him. It's a spiritual act of worship. It means way more than any song that I sing, any dollar I place in the offering, any sermon that I preach. It's that my life is offered up for him. Right? I become nothing, he becomes everything. There's another one that means a lot to me. It's from Ephesians chapter 5 verse 3. Because I've struggled with sexual sin and it says not a hint of sexual immorality. Not a hint. And I heard somebody express this one time in a, in a way that's gross and disgusting but makes complete and total sense. Right? If you're making brownies and you drop one on the floor and it happens to touch a spot where there was some dog poo, you don't pick it up and eat it. Right? If somebody says, oh, yeah, it's just a little bit. I mean, I cleaned it up. Right? I, I wiped it down with some bounty. It's good. You'd be like, ain't no way, buddy. This is not happening. And this is how God looks at our sin. Right? Not one hint. Not one hint. Where do you need to to lean on God's truth? Maybe you need to spend some time this week just just asking, God, search me. Help me to understand. Guide me in your truth. Help me to, to rewrite the program. Help me to dig a trench of truth so that that lie that's leading me to anxious thoughts is replaced with peace that comes through the Spirit of God. Help me to find that. Another key that I think is really important for this is this thing that we talked about uh, a little while back from John chapter 15. To abide in Christ. Remain in me and I in you and you will bear much fruit. Right? To abide, to be in relationship with. I said before that those lists, the the, the do's and the do nots, those can get pretty daunting. They can be pretty overwhelming. But what if I were to tell you that if you just get yourself in proximity to Jesus, those things will happen. It's a game changer, guys. You don't have to simply change your behavior when you change who you're hanging out with. One of the hardest things to do when you want to alter your life is to change your your situation, your circumstances, your friends that you're encountering and put yourself in positive environments. Then there is no more positive environment than the author of the truth that we're trying to write on our heart. And if we can abide with Jesus and we abide in His Word, John chapter 8, then we will know the truth and the truth will set us free. All the things that you're trying to work on on the outside, all the peripheral your heart will change and the actions that flow from it will change because instead of focusing on the external, you're allowing God to do what only God can do on the inside. Abide in Him. So what's your next step? I've given you a few. Right? Identify the lies in your life. What are they? What truths from God's Word counteract that lie that you're being told? That's, this is exactly how Jesus responded when he was led away and enticed, tempted in the desert, Matthew chapter 4. Satan would, would draw him in. He would try to deceive him, and Jesus would respond with truth from Scripture. Right? Our answer is in, in the model of Jesus. That we respond with truth. What truth is in God's Word? What truth do you need to repeat, to meditate on, to to regurgitate on, like we get absolutely every ounce of meaning from it that we can. Apply it in our life. Allow it to change the way that we think because we're not conformed to the pattern of the world, but we're transformed by the renewing of our mind. Guys, will you join me in in striving after this renewed mind, this new way of thinking, and allowing Jesus 
to control our thoughts and our actions. Because I believe when we do that, we're going to see the anxiety level decrease. And we're going to see our faith increase. Father, we thank you for allowing us an opportunity to dive into your word and to understand you a little bit better. And I pray the same prayer that we've been praying. Search us. It's hard. It's dangerous. There's a a lot of insecurity there. There's a lot of failure that's in our past. There's a lot of hurt. And there's a lot of lies. Sometimes we don't even see those things. They're blind spots for us. And we need you to dig deep into our life. To do a, a little soul cleansing to help us to call out the lies. Father, we need to be surrounded by by people who understand your word of truth. We're going to help guide us in your paths of righteousness. Father, draw up for us a new community of believers, a new family that is going to help us to think more clearly and to make better choices. Help us to dig deeper into your word so that we know the truth and we can call out the lies. Father, help us to keep it at the forefront of our mind, to repeat it over and over and over again, to internalize it, to write it on our hearts, to allow it to illuminate our paths. Father, help us. Help us to abide in you. When life gets busy, it gets crazy, it gets hectic, when we start to chase after all the things that we want or that we like or that we think is going to make somebody else in our family more happy. Father, help us to hit the pause button and remember that we need to stay connected to you. Prune us. Help us to cut away the things that get in the way. Father, help us to receive that life and that peace that you've promised so clearly. It's in Jesus' name we pray.